Welcome to School Your Soul, where we interview some of the wisest people on the planet, exploring ideas that nourish your mind, body, and spirit. It's education for your soul, and I'm your host, Sarah Cordial. Hey guys, welcome to a new episode of School Your Soul. We have a very exciting guest on the show today. Dr. Dan Siegel is a clinical professor of psychiatry at the UCLA School of Medicine and the founding co-director of the Mindful Awareness Research Center at UCLA. With a medical degree from Harvard University and postgrad medical education at UCLA, Dan is an award-winning educator and a pioneer in a field called interpersonal neurobiology. He has lectured for the King of Thailand, Pope John Paul II, and His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Dr. Siegel is also the executive director of the Mindsight Institute, an educational organization which offers online learning and in-person seminars that focus on how the development of Mindsight in individuals, families, and communities can be enhanced by examining the interface of human relationships and basic biological processes. As an internationally renowned neuropsychiatrist and author, Dr. Siegel's books have been translated into over 40 languages. His New York Times bestseller, Aware, The Science and Practice of Presence, which we talk about today, provides practical instruction for mastering the wheel of awareness. The wheel of awareness is a life-changing tool for cultivating more focus, presence, and peace in one's day-to-day life. Everyone must try this. It's free. You can download it online right now. The link is in the show notes um, or go to schoolyoursoulpodcast.com. This practice can benefit anyone. Dan says kids even as young as kindergarten can benefit. So give it a whirl. You won't regret it. Dr. Siegel says integration is the basis for health. So in today's show, we discuss what is integration and how do we cultivate more of it in our lives, the value and importance of mind training, the bridge between science and spirituality, why we sometimes make the wrong choices for ourselves even when we know they're not good for us, how we can cultivate our minds to give ourselves more resilience, and much, much more. So... Just to give you guys a heads up, there is some science and big concepts thrown around today. So if anything goes over your head, stick with it because Dan is great about bringing ideas back around to a simple place that we can all understand. Dan offers some really mind-blowing ideas today. So get ready and enjoy the show. Hey guys, welcome to the show. We are here with Dr. Dan Siegel. I'm so excited to have you here, Dan. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Great to be here with you, Sarah. Uh, As I just mentioned to you before we started recording, I saw you speak at the Sages and Scientists Symposium in LA back in 2016, and we did the Wheel of Awareness practice then, and I just did it right before the interview now, so I'm excited to get to pick your brain, and I read your new book, Aware, which I'm really excited about. Um, So I I thank you again for being here, and I think the work you do is so fascinating, and um, I'm definitely a beginner in the field of neuroscience, so you'll have to be patient with me. As I mentioned before, I had your colleague Rudy Tanzi on the show, but outside of that, um, I'm definitely a beginner on the topic, so so bear with me today. No problem. Okay. We're all beginners in that field, too. Perfect. I love to hear that. So before we dive into your new book, I want to clarify some terminology. Um, you work in the field of interpersonal neurobiology. Can you explain to us what that is? Absolutely. Well, interpersonal neurobiology is basically a phrase I made up to indicate a field where what we do is integrate all the different sciences into one framework. So we take, for example, mathematics and physics, chemistry and biology, which would include the different branches of neuroscience, for example, or genetics. We take the field of psychology, of linguistics, of sociology, of anthropology, and then we see what do they find as independent disciplines that share a common ground and then see if it relates to things, for example, in the arts or in contemplative practice or the overall field of mental health. And that's basically what the field of interpersonal neurobiology is. I'm the editor of a series in that we have literally over 70 textbooks now in that 
field that other people have written. And when you look at interpersonal neurobiology overall, it helps understand, for example, how we grow in families or how schools might want to function optimally or as individuals, what we might do to cultivate well-being in our lives or even how organizations may work to optimize their innovation and the sense of purpose that their employees have. So it has a lot of applications in different fields of life. Mm, fascinating. How did you end up in, in that specific niche? Well, you know, I was trained originally as a college student in biochemistry, um, but actually I learned also while I was studying enzymes, you know, about working on a suicide prevention service. So I went to medical school. I always thought there'd be a way to combine a deep scientific understanding of things like molecular reactions with emotions and our relationships mm -hmm. with each other because on the suicide prevention service, it was how you communicated with another human being that would keep hope alive and keep them alive. So as I went through medical school, it was very um, disillusioning for me how little attention was paid to relationships or to the inner nature of the mind. So I ended up dropping out and through a long set of journeys that I actually describe in a book called Mind, I decided to come back to medical school with this word mind sight in my own mind realizing that the teachers probably didn't change very much. Mm -hmm. And so Mindsight became my kind of guiding light as I finished medical school, decided to go uh, initially into pediatrics, then into adult psychiatry, then child and adolescent psychiatry. Then I became a researcher in relationships, looking at parent-child relationships called attachment. And then I was on the faculty for a while as the training director in child and adolescent psychiatry. And then ultimately, Started, we started our own school, a freestanding school, school called the Mindsight Institute, which kind of teaches this across all the different groups that might be interested, parenting groups, individuals, uh, clinicians of all sorts, um, organizations, meditative groups, uh, spiritual groups. So it, it turns out it's been applied to, in lots of different ways to really understand the mind and mental health. Got it. And mindsight is a term you, you coined, and it's defined as a skill of the mind that promotes insight, empathy, and integration. And I think, um, as you mentioned before, I think we don't see that enough in, in science and the medical field in particular. And that seems to be that's at the crux of a lot of your work. You know, Sarah, it is, and it's amazing where you can go into, um, you know, a number of different fields. You might be surprised about this, but... You know, when I teach faculty at different medical schools and we note that postgraduate medical trainees, you know, working in the hospitals after medical school, went from a 44 percent burnout rate with anxiety, depression and even suicidal thoughts to now a couple of years later, it's up to 56 oh, wow. percent. And what I say to the faculty is we're not teaching those medical students about the mind and how to care for their own mind or even connect with the mind of their patients. Around the same time, um, I got another call from the veterinarians of America. So I spoke to, in one group, the equine veterinarians, 2,000 of them, and then the general veterinarians, 3,000, you know, because they now have the highest suicide rate of any profession. Um, and so, again, here are clinicians not being taught mindsight skills to understand with insight and empathy what's going on so that when they come up with the distress that is natural in these fields, you know, there's a there's a huge burnout rate. So a mindsight is, you know, a really important skill we could, could be teaching in schools, but we generally don't. And you could actually find a way even in professional training to make sure that we teach people about, you know, the nature of the mind and, you know, it's kind of where this book Aware you know, dives you deeply into, well, how could I cultivate as a reader my own mind to really give myself resilience and a stronger mind? And that's that's kind of why I wrote Aware. Yes, absolutely. And and integration is another word that feels like it's at the heart of your work. What is integration and why is it so important? I know it's studies of well-being have found that the best predictor of health and happiness is having an integrated brain. And that is a, a major theme in this book. Um, and you talk about all these practical ways that we can 
kind of help integrate our own brain. But what what is integration in its simplest form and why is it so important? Well, Sarah, these these questions you're asking are so central to everything. So thanks for being oh, such a wonderful conversation. Part in Thank these, you. Just a teeny bit of a background. You know, in this journey, there was a question in my mind, like, how could, for example, the physiological reactions of enzymes somehow bring health to who you are? Um, and then the relational connections we have also bring health to you, who you are. And, and the, the journey to try to answer that question led to this kind of central process, let's just call it mind, which was both a fully embodied process, something that had to do with your whole bodily experience, not just what was happening in your brain and your head. But as an attachment researcher, you know, we were studying mental processes as they were shared in a relationship between a young child and a parent mm -hmm. or other caregivers. So to me, as well as my colleagues who are in anthropology or sociology or linguistics, you know, the mind was relational. So to put all that together, you, you basically say the mind somehow is both embodied and relational. What could be both within you and between you? And that led a long time ago to the proposal that the system of mind might be about energy flow. Some of that flow, that change of energy, you know, could have symbolic value and we call it information. And so energy and information flow is the fundamental unit. Now, I'm giving you all this background because otherwise it'll seem like it just came out of thin air. <laughs> but, but when you say that and you say, well, what could the system of the mind be that's energy and information flow within you and between you? And it turns out it has characteristics of what's called a complex system. And that's a mathematical term. And in math, there's a finding that complex systems have their elements, like let's say a cloud, interact with each other. And that gives rise to something called an emergent phenomenon. The one particular emergent property is called self-organization. And so back in the early 90s, I made the proposal that the mind could be defined, even though no fields define it really, except short of calling it brain activity, but that the mind could be defined in this way as an emergent, embodied, and relational self-organizing process that is regulating energy and information flow. And once you make that proposal, then you can ask the question, this regulatory process, how does it optimize what it's doing? And then there's an answer from math, which is you differentiate elements and you link them. And then we can create a common term, integration, which is defined as the linkage of differentiated parts. Differentiated means they're distinguished or their differences are clarified and honored linkage is connecting stuff right like mm -hmm. you and me um, connecting to each other you can have your questions i can have my responses we're differentiating but we're linking right mm -hmm. if you were to ignore what i said that would be breaking the linkage if i felt i had to say exactly what you said you know like a mirror that we wouldn't be differentiating so you and i can have an integrated conversation here and it turns out that integration is how you optimize self-organization and what that creates is a feeling of harmony and it's the most flexible and adaptive resilient or coherent energized and stable flow and the bottom line from that from the early 90s was i said whoa that flexible adaptive state maybe that's the state of well-being and so the proposal from the early 90s was integration is the basis of health mm. And what would we be able to explore to see if that were true? So in the last 25 years, you know, I've published a bunch of books, but especially a textbook called The Developing Mind, where, you know, whenever I have these groups of interns, I just had 16 interns work with me. I say to them, I want you to find one piece of evidence that goes against what the developing mind says, which is integration is health. And they can't find a single thing and lots of things to support it. So we wouldn't say it's proven but so far, it's been really powerful where when integration is present, harmony emerges. And when integration is absent, because you've blocked linkage or differentiation or both, then you get chaos or rigidity. Mm. That's the whole model. And I gave you all that background just so 
any of your listeners listening in say, well, it's just an opinion or it's just this weird thing, but it actually comes from a deep analysis that then made predictions. And now we have these findings that every study of serious psychiatric disorders has impaired integration in the brain. And a study called the Human Connectome Project came out and one of our online, we have an online program, one of our online students called us and said, hey, did you see this study that just came out? And she sent it to us. Sure enough, they looked at the opposite of disturbance. They looked at well-being and every measure of well-being these researchers could assess was predicted by one brain factor. And that was how, in their terms, how interconnected your connectome was. That's how the differentiated areas of the brain are linked, how integrated. Wow. So that's where that comes from. Wow, that was, that's great. So I guess if integration is the basis of health, the natural question is, how can we cultivate more integration into our lives? And you talk a lot about this in the book. I want to help people understand the wheel of awareness practice throughout this whole episode. Um, so we can break it down and kind of talk about the different facets. But first off, just what what in its simplest form is the wheel of awareness practice? This, Sarah, this is so great. You're so clear. It's, it's just so, fun. <laughs> so picture this. Picture you're, you're an active therapist and you've come across in your academic work this idea that integration is health. And then you're working with teachers and parents and your patients. And you come to realize that anyone who's trying to create intentional change uses consciousness, a teacher in a classroom, a parent in a home interaction or you in therapy. And then I thought, well, if consciousness is needed for intentional change and integration is health, what if you integrated consciousness? So in my office, there's a table and the table has a central glass hub and an outer wooden rim. And I would bring the patients up from the chair or the couch where they were sitting and I'd say, hey, let's try this thing. Let's try to integrate consciousness. And they go, what are you talking about? And I'd say, well, you know, integration is the base of health and consciousness needed for intentional change. So what if we differentiated the elements of consciousness and then linked them? They go, like, what does that mean? I said, well, let's stand around this table and imagine the hub of the table is like, if I say to you, Sarah, hello. Hello. <laughs> you have the experience, right? Did you know I said hello? Yes. Right. So you have the experience of knowing. Let's just call that being aware. And let's put that in the hub of the table. And then the hello itself was a sound. And that's on the rim. So you could then divide the rim up into four parts where, you know, anything that's unknown, like what you hear, see, taste, smell or touch, first segment of the rim. You then move this spoke, a metaphoric spoke of attention over to the second segment. That's the interior signals of the body, the muscles, the bones, the intestines, the heart, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Then we would move the spoke over to the third segment. That would be mental activities like emotions or memories or thoughts or ideas or images, stuff like that, mental activities. And then even move the spoke over one more time to the fourth segment. And this was our sense of relationality. Like, Right now, Sarah, can you feel that you and I have a connection with each other? Yes. Yeah, and maybe listeners feel it too to us. And, and that's a, a sense of our interconnection. And let's just call that a relational sense. Mm -hmm. So, you know, those were the four segments of the rim that were the knowns. And then as we went forward with this, people started getting better. And then one day I even had some patients start to bend the spoke around right into the hub itself to experience pure awareness, awareness of awareness. Later, as I would do this in, in, with my um, students who are therapists and, you know, ultimately in workshops when it seemed to be working in these smaller settings. And now I've done it with, you know, systematically with over 10,000 people. But with the first 10,000, I recorded the results. So I have this 10,000 person study of the wheel of awareness. And what's been so interesting about it is it doesn't really matter the person's background or you know, educational background or meditation history or anything, they can do the practice and it seems to reduce anxiety, reduce mild to moderate depression, help with trauma, and in many other ways give people a feeling of vitality and joy and gratitude that is really opening them up to really the experience of what you would call 
presence. And that's basically what the wheel of awareness is. It's my daily practice, you know, where I do this very simple practice of moving the spoke around, bending the spoke into the the hub and having this as a daily experience of integrating consciousness. How long is your daily practice now? You know, some days, like today, I did it for about 10 minutes. I have a short version where on each breath you move the spoke around. Other days I can do it for 30 minutes. You know, on the website we have a seven minute version and we have a 30 minute version. You know, it depends on, you know, what you'd like to do that day. Um, even with kids, young kids, they just draw the, the wheel out. It's not even a reflective practice, but just knowing, you know, that the hub is this spacious source of being aware um, can be very helpful in ways we can talk about if you want. I love it. It's just such a unique way of stating something that I've learned in so many different that's been kind of taught to me in so many different ways. I really appreciate the visual nature of it. It helps. It enhances my experience a lot. I mean, that's so great to hear. And I think that's what a lot of people feel. And what's so interesting about that is the visual image. Of course, it's just a map. It just gives you a kind of like any map, a guide to getting somewhere. And then when you start exploring that peaceful feeling, you can let go of the map and just let the peaceful feeling be itself. You don't have to say, oh, my God, it's a hub. It's a hub. It's a hub. No. The, the the image of a wheel got you there and then you put the map in your pocket and just enjoy being, you know, on the beach or in the forest, wherever you, you took yourself to. So could we talk about um, the, the different segments specifically? For instance, does each segment kind of provide a different integration that, that we're looking for? So, for instance, the touch, taste, smell, sight, your five senses, your hearing, what what is that enhancing in us? What is that helping us do? Well, the first thing that it does is it kind of anchors you in a very familiar world. So you're used to hearing things, for example. But what the practice does is it gives you the opportunity to focus only on sound, right? Mm. So for many people, what this does is it allows them to have this enrichment in what they're experiencing that really uh, really enlivens their life. And you do the same for sight, for example, for smell. So like when I go walking, let's say in the park, and there's a bed of roses, you know, I have this wonderful opportunity to take my daily practice that I do, you know, just at home. But then when I'm at the park, I know how to just activate that sense of smell and bring myself down to the rose and just get lost in that rose. It's a beautiful feeling. Or if you're having a meal, you know, to, to say to people you might be eating with, let's take a pause and just taste our food, you mm -hmm. know. And um, it's amazing when you differentiate those senses, how richer they become and how much more appreciation for the subtleties of things, for their details, you know, aromas, the textures, all that stuff. And so on the one hand, that's something it does. But another thing it does is it's the beginning of differentiating not just each sense from the other, these rim points, but it's differentiating the hub from the rim. Because after all, as you go from hearing to seeing, let's say, it's a different source of input, right? Mm -hmm. One is sound, the other is light. And it feels very differently to see something, to hear something, but it's all being held within the hub of awareness. So you're also in this very beginning differentiating hub from rim, which, as you'll see in a few moments, becomes a very important skill to have. So, yes, it gives you a richer sense of a life, which is a great gift that the wheel gives you every day. And it starts this beautiful way of both differentiating rim from hub, right, the knowns from the knowing, mm -hmm. and then also linking them, because after all, you're sending a spoke out. And that's what that first segment experience does. Overall, in terms of the research, this would fit into the first of three pillars that have been shown to be really helpful in strengthening the mind. And this is called focused attention mm. because you're choosing, you know, okay, now it's sound, now it's sight, now it's smell, now it's taste, now it's touch. So it's, it's harnessing the power of attention to focus on one thing at a time, which in our distracted 
world we live in, this is a really helpful skill to cultivate. Yes, focused attention is something you talk about a lot. And um, let's talk a little bit about mind training in general. So you said that there's, and then I do want to get back to the wheel and the other segments, but just overall, the importance of mind training. um, You say in the book, the three pillars of mind training are focused attention, open awareness, and training of compassion. Right. So what, why are these three, why are these the three pillars of mind training? Well, you know, the way the research has unfolded is it turns out that the um, carefully done studies of um, mind training, which is another term for meditation, um, you know, and these meditation studies that show positive effects that have been done in a rigorous way have been done on traditional approaches that happen to use these three distinct uh, steps. Focusing attention is one. Opening awareness is two, and cultivating love and kindness, or what I call kind intention, is number three. And they're usually done in separate practices. So that's from the research. Now, the wheel of awareness was developed independent of those traditional forms of meditation. I actually didn't even know there was a whole field of meditation or meditation research. When I developed the wheel, it was just to integrate consciousness And it just was fortunate that, as you'll see, the the wheel has in the first two segments, you focus attention and strengthen that. In the third segment, you're opening awareness. And in the fourth segment, you're actually cultivating kind intention, a sense of our interconnectivity. Mm -hmm. Um, And it just was fortunate that the three um, basic forms of meditation that, that each contribute to Uh, incredibly powerful findings um, of well-being that we can talk about uh, that meditation done with these three pillars creates. It turns out they're all, all three, which were independently found, happened to exist in this one practice called the wheel. That's amazing. It it was amazing. It was amazing. That's for sure. Um, Yeah. So, yeah. So that's, that, so in terms of where the three pillars come from, you know, if you read altered traits or there's a number of studies that talk about these three pillars um, uh, that have been uh, written about, um, it's just what the science happened to find. And I'm sure we're going to find other pillars, you know, like Tom Singer is a researcher who's doing beautiful work on, you know, the importance of, the, you know, refining this kind of way of knowing your inner life, you know, which in our world we would call mind sight, you know that that actually promotes these ways of when you honor different aspects of yourself, we call it state integration. It leads to all sorts of positive changes too. So we have nine domains of integration, so maybe there'll be nine pillars in the future. But at this point, those are three solidly uh, established pillars um, of mind training that support well-being. I love I love that we can kind of involve science in this conversation because so many of my conversations don't involve science. And I think a lot of people really love to be able to rest their assurances on that it's been scientifically proven. So so everybody knows mindful awareness practices that science has revealed promote well-being and body, mind, and relationships. Um, some examples are sitting meditation, walking meditation, yoga, tai chi, qigong, prayer and the wheel of awareness, which is um, what we're talking about today. Um, So really quick, I kind of want to make sense of this chaos and rigidity piece, because that's the opposite of integration is if you're stuck in chaos or rigidity. Is that correct? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So um, you say in the book, getting lost in familiar places on the rim, even if these sensations or thoughts or feelings arise from trauma and receiving suboptimal care, can ironically be more reassuring than entering a state of uncertainty and freedom, the experience of the hub. This pattern of being drawn to the abused state of mind, those repeated rim elements may involve what for some is a passive victim stance and for others may be an active angrily fighting back stance. So I think this is something we can all relate to because we have our pain, we have our trick, we have our traumas that we can 
be triggered by in our everyday life. And we can continue to go back to that spot and that same spot on the rim in your terminology. Can you give us an example? Maybe that would probably be easier for people to understand of someone who ex- has experienced this, um, going back to those same spots in the rim and this chaos and rigidity theory. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, in the book, I talk about, um, teaching the reader and inviting them to dive into the wheel of awareness practice. And then I give five uh, stories in the beginning. And then later on, when you do the practice yourself as the reader, and then you get into the science, you explore these five individuals experience. So one of the individuals I name uh, as a, as Teresa, that's obviously her name. Um, And she experienced trauma. So she would be a good example uh, to refer to, because then you can read in more depth in the book. Um, and you know, I know the name of your podcast is school, your soul, right? Yes. So I'll just say this as we about to, we're about to dive into this, that, you know, I just came back from Ireland where, um, we were honoring a dear friend and colleague of mine, John O'Donohue, which in Ireland you pronounce John Mm O'Donohue. And he had been a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful poet and philosopher and former Catholic priest. So John and I were writing all this stuff about the bridge between science and spirituality. And uh, the name of the talk I gave um, over the two days for this gathering was called Soul and Synapse. Ah. And there were a lot of people there who had never heard about much about science. Certainly John was had not been schooled in it before we started working together. Um, even though he had his PhD in philosophy and everything. Um, And so what I want to say is what we're about to talk about actually relates to the topic of your, your, the title of your podcast um, in a way that I guess if John and his body were still alive, you know, it'd be great to have him join us in this conversation because I think, I think we're really at a moment in the unfolding of our understanding, as I hope to describe in, in the Aware book, you know, where the the separation between science and spirituality is really unnecessary mm-hmm. and maybe even harmful. Yes. Um, you know, so finding meaning and connection in your life, which a lot of people say is the deep essence of spirituality, and having an empirical way of understanding what life is about, which is what we call science shouldn't be separated yes so what we're about to talk about you know when we talk about trauma and getting lost in familiar places is what your question is about actually directly relates to the idea of soul and the idea of an essence of meaning and connection that transcends these physical bodies we live in yes um so let me take it step by step as it relates to the wheel of awareness the question of why people get lost in familiar places um, brings up from a scientific point of view a word called um, self-reinforcement or recursivity is the formal term, where something kind of reinforces its own nature, mm-hmm. right? And you see that in developmental science all the time. And it can happen in families and it can happen in a brain, you know. Mm-hmm. And so we want to just honor that there is this mechanism where even if something isn't very helpful or productive, its familiarity has kind of laid down, if you will, these paths in the snow, if you want to use that analogy, that when the next person comes down the hill, she will be likely to go down that same path, Mm -hmm. even if it's not the optimal path. It's just the groove is laid down, so the next person goes, and the next person goes, the next person goes. And before you know it, you know, that is the familiar path If you want to call it the path of least resistance, that's fine, too. But then it recursively, that is repeatedly, reinforces that path as the path to take. Yes. Even though it may not be the optimal path. So that's, in the brain, you know, that's one way just to simply state how we, in the mind, in terms of our subjective experience and consciousness and information processing, those are three of the four facets of mind, we get lost in familiar places with those three facets because there are these grooves that are carved out, if you will, if you want to look at the brain side of it. Now, is that a neural pathway? 
Is that, that would be that would be a neural pathway, okay. right? That's that's a great. A simple example would be, um, you know, we're born into a body that has a long evolutionary history. Part of it is a reptilian deep part of our brain stem, part of our brains, the lowest part, you know, that is in charge of keeping us alive when we're threatened. And it has four fundamental F's that it does. It it fights back, flees, freezes, or faints. Mm. Those four F's are just part of the genetically inherited tendency of a nervous system to react to threat. So trauma is a threat state in all the different kinds of trauma. It could be neglect, it could be abuse of all the different kinds, you know, that then activates our threat reaction. So to just say it in a quick way, the more you activate a circuit, the connections within that circuit are strengthened, and then the more likely that circuit is to be activated in the future. And I, right, so, and the way to think about it is this following phrase, where attention goes, that's the streaming of energy flow, neural firing flows and neural connection grows. Mm -hmm. So that's how the circuit gets established, reinforced, strengthened, and then it becomes that pathway in the snow, Mm -hmm. right? So now that person with a reinforced threat reaction is in kindergarten or in sixth grade or going out on a date or whatever and can have an increased likelihood of the threat reaction being turned on that induces from their date or from their kid in kindergarten or their teacher a reaction that isn't ready for a threat response but it itself feels threatened by the threat response. So it creates a hostile reaction, which then intensifies the threat reaction of the person we're talking about, mm. right? So in their relational world, the world of the betweenness of the mind, because the mind is both within and between us, you know, this betweenness of the mind is encouraged to activate threat type interactions that reinforce the inner pathway. So now it's both the inner pathway that was created and it's inducing in this recursive way interactions with the world around it. You know, it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Yeah. So without an intervention like the wheel of awareness, that stuff is all just rim stuff, mm-hmm. which we, when we live on automatic pilot, the rim just takes over. So what the wheel of awareness does in ways, you know, we hopefully we'll get to in just a moment You know, the wheel of awareness allows the hub, the state of receptive awareness, the state of presence, to put a pause between automatic reactions and actual behaviors to break the recursive cycle of being lost in familiar places. Mm -hmm. Well, very well put. And when you take that accessible skill, it's why I wrote the book Aware, And then, you know, we did this, I did this with 10,000 people, recorded the results, and then asked the question, if the mind is an emergent property of energy, as we mentioned earlier, what actually is energy? You come to this really fascinating scientific view that takes us beyond the brain and into the mind and even into questions about the soul that is really, really fascinating. When you look at the 10,000 person study, and I give you the overall findings in the aware book and say, well, what is the hub actually? Mm -hmm. Um, And you say, well, if the hub is about awareness, which is how we've defined it, you know, and that is an aspect of mind, which we're saying it is, you know, the mind is your subjective experience, your capacity to be aware of that subjective experience, like me saying, hello, Sarah. Mm -hmm. Um, what is the knowing part of that? Yes. And then you go to the 10,000 person study where people bend the spoke around into the hub itself and they describe the following things. They say, oh my gosh, time disappeared. I felt this incredible expansiveness. I felt connected to everything. I felt eternity, infinity. I felt God. I felt love. I felt this incredible peace and tranquility and joy. I felt this emptiness, but it was also full at the same time. And everyone would say, it's so hard to put words to. Mm -hmm. And so when I turned to physicists 
and said, the experts in energy, and said, listen, what is energy? And of course, they say it's different forms, electrical chemistry, I mean, electrical energy, chemical energy, mechanical energy, light energy, sound energy, all these kinds of energy. I said, but what does energy itself share in common? They go, oh, that's easy. And here's what they said that blew my mind. They said, energy is the movement from possibility to actuality. Mm, wow. Yeah, and I said, mm, wow, just like that. <laughs> and then I went, oh my gosh. And I took out some paper and I graphed out this way you would show this visually, because I'm also uh, a visual person like you. And, and if you make it, let's say the up and down part of this graph would be called the y-axis. Let's call that a probability distribution graph where the top of it is 100% when a possibility is turned into an actuality. Like right now, if I say to you, Sarah, I'm thinking of a word and you and I share a million words. Right. What's your chance of knowing the word? Not good. Not good. One out of a million. It's near zero. We put that at the bottom of the graph, near zero. But the top of the graph, when I finally say ocean, would be 100%. Mm -hmm. So let's call the 100% point a peak. Okay. And then if I say, okay, Sarah, I'm only going to say one of the five oceans on the planet. Your chance of guessing would be one out of five. So that would be a plateau of elevated probability. One out of five is a lot greater than one out of a million. Right. Um, and so we would have in this graph three things. The top of an actualization would be called a peak. The bit lower down we'll call a plateau of increased probability. But then when you go all the way down, where all possibilities rest. In physics, they call that the sea of potential. On our graph, if we draw it, drew, drew it as a three-dimensional graph, you would show it as a plane, and we'll call it the plane of possibility. Okay. This plane is basically the mathematical space that physics describes, they call it the quantum vacuum, which is the formless source of all form. It's the generator of diversity. Okay. And what I think might be going on, based on the Wheel of Awareness findings from the 10,000 person study, is the following. A peak would be, for example, on a rim when you have a thought. And just beneath the peak would be thinking. Or a peak might be a memory, and just beneath the peak might be remembering. Or a peak might be an emotion, and just beneath the peak might be emoting. And then when you get a little bit further down, you may draw a plateau, which would be like a, a mood or a state of mind or an intention you have. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a filter of consciousness that determines only the subset of peaks that could possibly arise from that plateau. Mm -hmm. But then the question is... If that's all the rim stuff, that energy is manifesting itself toward actuality in these degrees of probabilities up to actualization, if that's what energy is, what is the hub? Mm -hmm. And when you look at the data all around the planet, no matter a person's background, you look at that data, people describe that time disappears, that there's a feeling of connection to everything. There's this overwhelming feeling of joy, of love, of tranquility. And what I think might be going on, and this is supported by the common statement, it's both empty and full, is that the plane of possibility, this quantum vacuum, this mathematical space of the sea of potential, it is where it's empty of form, but the formless source of all form. So it's full of potential. It's empty and full at the same time. And the implications of this are really fascinating. It could be completely wrong. But if it's true, this 3P graph approach to what the mind is all about, if it's true, what it means is, number one, when we learn to do the wheel of awareness practice and harness our hub, we can basically expand this hub. So instead of being like the size of an espresso cup and life dishes out, you know, a spoon of salt and we can't drink it, we expand the hub of the wheel to be 100 gallons and we can drink 
anything that life dishes out because when you put in that tablespoon of salt, you know, you've now diluted it with 100 gallons of awareness. Mm -hmm. So not only do you do that, but you have a pause between impulse and action, right? And for whatever reason, and I don't know exactly why this would be the case, you have the subjective experience of being aware. But not only are you aware, and this is a third or fourth point, but you actually have dropped the probability position of your mind into the place where other options arise. So coming back to your question about trauma and getting lost in familiar places, when people do the wheel of awareness practice and they learn to access the hub, that's a metaphor. I think what they're doing in terms of a mechanism is they are taking their life experiences where trauma has reinforced, recursively reinforced plateaus that were serving to protect them that only allow certain peaks to arise. So they become imprisoning plateaus. There's nothing wrong with the plateau by itself. But if they're rigid and they're imprisoning you, that's not so good. Mm -mm. And what happens then is the plateau that's been reinforced keeps your life recursively doing the same thing over and over again. When you do a practice like the wheel, you're literally dropping the energy position out of those plateaus and the probability position now is in the plane. And not, not only are you aware, but now you have the other options to allow other energy configurations to arise because all energy arises from that plane. I see. Yeah. Okay. And just sense? to clarify one thing. So what, ha I mean, when we can expand the hub, what does that allow us to be in that space more frequently, more easily? What is the benefit to expanding the hub? More frequently, more easily, when we, we do that, we imbue, we, we, we place within our experience of the rim a deeper sense of flexibility and tranquility. So it changes the quality of day-to-day -day, um, experience, not just when you're doing the wheel practice for your half an hour a day or whatever you're doing. Um, and in addition, what it does is it creates more spontaneity and innovation because you're able to feel in metaphor terms, wheel terms, when you're on your rim and have an idea this way or that way and it's not working, you literally have learned the skill of dropping out of the rim and into the hub. And the hub not only gives you awareness of what's going on the rim, but it's the source of letting other rim elements be created, other you know, plateaus and peaks. So for people who are you know in any kind of work or even just life, you know, you actually become more spontaneously creative because you learn to drop into the plane of possibility and let creative ideas emerge rather than feel like you have to make them happen. And so the two things that seem to be coming when people describe how the wheel for them has been going, because we, we, we've been distributing this for a while on our website, people say this. They say, number one, they come to feel... Um, connected to other people in ways they never felt before. And that's probably because your plane and my plane and everyone else's plane who's listening to us or anyone's plane are identical. Infinity is infinity. And so we're differentiated on our plateaus and peaks, and that's fine, but we become linked through the plane of possibility, through awareness. And so this is where I think that sense of deep, loving connection comes from. That's one. And the other is that, especially for someone who's been traumatized, there can be a kind of clinging to control and certainty that has a feeling of I'm surviving, I'm surviving, I'm surviving, because I'm going to control things and really make sure I'm in charge. And initially, when a person who's found that as their survival strategy, when they try the wheel practice, the hub may feel a little bit scary because there is a plateau that's telling them uncertainty is bad. You survive by being certain. Mm -hmm. And sadly, think about it this way, that understandable adaptive survival mechanism ironically is imprisoning them in their own rigid behavior because if you can't drop into the hub, if you can't 
access this plane of possibility, you're not only restricting your awareness, right? Because that's it's like a filter of consciousness, but you're also restricting how you're going to live. Mm -hmm. And so what has been so beautiful, whether it's with my private patients or in workshops or getting reports what people experience, is when they do the Wheel of Awareness practice, what initially may have been scary actually becomes a sanctuary mm. because the plane of possibility is where you access not only in your daily practice, but also in how you come to live this feeling. And this is where the soul idea comes in. And I think it's what John and I were writing about before he passed um, or his body died, you know, the sense of a soul that John o O'Donohue used to talk about, John of Dunahu, um, that he used to talk about was deeply about this spacious place within us that transcends time. And when you look, and we're not getting into it here, but when you look at a very powerful physics view of things, mm -hmm. and I'll say this because I know you and I first met uh, at the Sages and Scientists Symposium 2016, mm -hmm. well, there was another person who was there who lived right next to Sir Isaac Newton's house. Mm -hmm. And she, having done the wheel and experienced the quantum nature of, in, in time terms, we have two realms of reality that have different properties. One is called the quantum realm of microstates, like electrons. The other is the realm of macro states, like big objects, like our bodies. Mm -hmm. and in the macro state world, we have what's called an arrow of time. Um, like, for example, if you and I break an egg open in a kitchen, we can't unbreak the egg. Mm -hmm. So it's a directionality of change. And that absolutely exists at the large object, what's called Newtonian, because Sir Isaac Newton figured out these properties like gravity um, state of reality. It's real. Absolutely. So when you get in an airplane, you want to get in a Newtonian airplane, right? That mm -hmm. has certainty. But quantum rules are not about certainties. They're about probabilities. So you don't really want to get in quantum airlines where, you know, when you get in the plane, they say, hello, you will probably get to New York. You know, <laughs> yeah. you, know you want to be in a Newtonian airlines. Mm -hmm. But here's the amazing thing. I think the plane of possibility is a quantum state that is arrow free and that when people access this state of pure awareness and even if you just get a glimpse of it in the practice just for a brief moment you're accessing this hub you're expanding the hub getting access to to, to answer your question yes it's how frequently you can tap into it it's that it expands because once you get into it it is timeless and it is boundaryless that's what the quantum view would suggest fits with what people describe. And so as you can come to live with it, as, as we did this at Sir Isaac Newton's house, because I actually went to England, oh, went, cool. we, we did the wheel of awareness around the apple tree where Sir wow. Isaac Newton gravity. <laughs> it was amazing. There's actually a film we're going to release soon about doing it there. Amazing. And, you know, it was crazy. And it was wild because as one workshop participant said, she was crying in the beginning of the workshop. And I said, what, tell, can you share with us what you're crying about? She said, I'm 65. My whole life of being aware, I thought I was insane because I had this sense of connection and timelessness that I always thought was something wrong with me. But now you've helped me see that the quantum level that likely lives in the hub, you know, in the plane of possibility is just quite distinct from the Newtonian level. And and listen, you know, the Scientific American this month was all about this distinction. When does quantum become Newtonian? So, I mean, these are these are real aspects of physics. But the mind is both. The mind has both an arrow of time, I think, as thoughts come and go. You can't get them back. But it's also timeless. So she says, now I know I'm not insane. I was just aware of these different domains that the mind can enter. Mm. I love it. I love it. Wow, you just gave me so much interesting information. I don't even know where to begin. But I will, since you're just talking about our, you know, this amazing interconnectedness of us all. I think that that's a really important theme on this this podcast. So I'd love to talk on touch on that because um, one of the segments on the wheel of awareness is 
really delving into this interconnectedness. And so much of our research is obviously, you know, pointing to the health promoting power of relationships and also science affirms that, you know, we're all connected to each other. And I think that can sometimes feel like a daunting concept to people and feel like, yeah, I I think that's true, but I don't really feel it in my body or know it. Um, And I think that the wheel of awareness helps really helps cultivate that sense um, and dissolves the shared myth of our separateness. So can you talk a little bit about the 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 statements of kind intention and the the concept of muy well absolutely sarah i mean here's the thing to think about so you know the we we've talked about the first segment the second is the interior of the body the third is mental activities and then you can bend the spoke around right into the hub itself to experience that and then you get to the fourth and final segment and this segment is about our interconnection right? i took this out of order though i, I know Not- i didn't do it in the order but I do no, want to make sure we talk about the interconnected part. Absolutely. I just wanted everybody to know that's where we are in the sequence. It's completely mm-hmm. great. Um, and here, you know, you're building on the experience that many people have of the hub itself, where it's not so much an idea, but it's a an experience that you feel it, right? Mm-hmm. And I've had a lot of people, you know, including uh, a Microsoft engineer in one, one workshop I did in Seattle, 70 year old guy, you know, who, who, who never meditated, never been in therapy, just retired. His wife was a therapist. She dragged him to the workshop, <laughs> as he said, you know, when he took the microphone after the wheel of awareness practice and he pauses, starts getting teary and he goes, I don't know what happened. But after I bent the spoke around into the hub, something shifted in me. And when we took a break afterwards, I went out and then he says this really slowly, but for our purposes, I'll say it quickly. He basically says, you know, I'm looking at a gardener who's watering the roses and there's birds and butterflies. He goes, I am the butterfly. I am the bird. Mm. I'm the gardener. I'm the water. Mm. And he's crying. Mm. And he had never experienced anything like that before. That's not something you can tell someone about. It's something that you experience as a shift in perception. Right. Mm -hmm. And he's not alone. I mean, this happens every time I do a workshop. And when my students come in there, they go, no one's going to believe you. I said, yeah, but I'm recording all this stuff. So they'll hear it. You know, we have the data. It's recorded. It's documented. So what's going on there is I think we have um, this issue where the human brain in what's called the default mode network these central circuits of the brain, creates this category of a term called self, S-E-L-F, and sees it as separate. And just as you beautifully said a moment ago, it's this shared consensus that the self lives in the head, if the mind is just coming from the brain, or, you know, coming from the body, that the skin encased body is some definition of self. But who we are is broader than the brain and bigger than the body. And that Microsoft engineer was tapping into reality, as one quantum physicist wrote in his first slide when we were beginning a quantum physics think tank. He said, quantum physics has revealed the interconnection of reality. The question is, what's wrong with the human brain that people don't realize how interconnected we are? Yes. Right. And this is probably one of the things that happens. We have a vulnerability to make a category called self as separate. We then recursively interpret things as separate and what has been so profound about the wheel practice and you know in the initial one it was just purely being open to our interconnectivity on this segment and then i was presenting it to a neuroscience lab richie davidson's lab and uh richie and his colleagues said hey why don't you add these verbal statements of you know kind regard and loving kindness i said well because this is just about integration i need to know whether there's any science that shows that that helps or that it's integrative. And they showed me that it was both. So I put it in after I was presenting it to the lab. So that's an added feature. And the idea of that is, and I, I, I liked it too as an opportunity to get in the we thing you're talking about, mm-hmm. because, you know, um, the idea there is that when you have categories in the brain, they often get linguistic symbols assigned them like self, right? Mm-hmm. And the studies of the brain in your head show that when you make statements with words that are said with authenticity, 
then other parts of the brain that are mediating those things like anger or love, they actually create these harmonics. That is, they, they induce brain firing patterns throughout the whole brain beyond the linguistic centers. So the reason I put in those words, and probably the reason Richie and other labs have found a very positive response to just saying quietly in your inner voice, these words of positive regard, you know, to all living beings, may they be, you know, happy, healthy, safe, and live with well-being. And we do this, you know, then finally with not only to all living beings, to yourself, but also to me, we, you get embedded in there the idea that you are both an inner person, that's a me, but you're also a relational person, that's a we. And to integrate, you want to differentiate and link, and that's a we, right? So we wish those same things for us, you know, for <laughs> you say, we be happy and all those things. And what's been so beautiful about it is it, it opens up the perceptual windows to see in a different way, to feel deeply interconnected, not just to have the words, but actually to sense the reality of that. And when you look at love as something emerging from the plane of possibility, and there's all sorts of reasons to think that that's the truth, you know, then you realize you're liberating this soul to soul connection, this way you look into another person. This is how I talk about the story of Teresa, that even though she was severely, severely traumatized, Nothing could take her plane of possibility away. Her own plateaus were imprisoning her from the freedom that would come from that plane. But she was lost in familiar places in these plateaus that wanted her to be in control. And so part of the task of our therapeutic relationship was for me to give her the wheel of awareness practice as an exercise to do fine. But that she could learn that that deep part of her essence, some people call self, some people say mind, some people may soul, some people may say heart, the essence of who she is was not lost. It was just that her survival strategies kept her from experiencing that. And that place is exactly the place that not only she finds freedom and joy and love, but she finds connections with other people. And, and that's how the whole thing kind of comes together these days and it's just been uh, an amazing journey to be bringing the science in with the spirituality of our deep meaning and connection and really seeing how individual transformation can be fostered by integrating consciousness in these ways yes 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 and and you talk about the um the benefits of it being a regular practice and the importance of it being a regular practice um, of moving something from state to trait, like we can really train ourselves to have it. It starts as just a state during the practice, but doing it over and over, it can really you can really manifest and cultivate specific traits that you're trying to bring into your life, which I exactly. thought was beautiful. Exactly, and that's you know that's where this is you know free. It's not like you have to buy a gadget. You don't have to go you know for twenty years of training and this or that. It's something you can start right now and bring it into your life. And what well, you've experienced yourself, it's, it's just so deeply rewarding to know that people can be empowered to have what you might call pervasive leadership. That is that each of us can be empowered to bring this more integrative way of living and realize how deeply interconnected we all are. Mm hmm. And I think um, another thing that I'm just I'm like looking at the actual diagram of the wheel of awareness right now. And I think for me, when I think about it, you're, you're putting the spoke out and you're using your awareness into these different facets. And even just I mean, I, I've experienced these different things in different parts of my study and my practices, but doing it all in kind of the sequence, I think there's something so special about it because I know when I spend time doing yoga or I'm really doing a meditation where I'm putting attention at different parts of my body, that is so calming. Just the act of observing my body is, I can tell, is so calming and so soothing to my body. And I can feel a difference and a release in just putting my attention there. Same with my mind. The minute I start saying, okay, I'm going to let anything come into my mind, which is part of that um, 
that segment. I'm going to let whatever comes into my mind come. I <laughs> Nothing comes. It's silence. It's so relaxing. It is it's just this unbelievable experience. I don't, I don't know how to ex- describe it, but having yeah. the sequence is so cool. That's exactly. Oh, it's so beautiful here, Sarah. And, and, you know, your experience of that peacefulness and that clarity, it is a way of being. And I think it does come from the sequence of the wheel that when you, when you start experiencing it, you go, wow, this is just right there for me to make a, a trait in my life. Mm-hmm. You know, Absolutely. Now, you don't just hang out in the plane of possibility all the time. It's just accessible to you. It's like living from the plane, not just living in the plane, because, you know, you, you've got to go to work. You have to pay your taxes. When you get to an intersection, if you're in a car, you have to use your plateau of driving the car and a peak of stepping on the brakes, you know, because otherwise you will be one with everything, you know, <laughs> intersection. So it's more about an integrated life where you're embracing all of these elements of the mind, you know, these peaks, plateaus, and, and, and the plane. And when you do that, then life becomes really exciting and liberating. It's just, and I'm so happy to hear of uh, your experience with it. So, yeah, I mean, what a powerful gift you've been able to bring to, to people with this. I feel like it must be so rewarding to see, to have workshops and to hear how people have been affected by it. Yeah, it's deeply rewarding. And I feel I I really feel like it's a journey we're all on together. Mm -hmm. So I'm so thrilled to have conversation, you know, with you and with with others bringing this out into the world. And then what we can do, and we can do together, (laughs) is say, how do you help, you know, kids and adolescents and adults? How do we we help each other create this um, shift in awareness, dropping into the plane? So we realize that you know, and I say this to kids in schools, you know, we're not just the isolated candle trying to be, you know, this fancy, waxy, shiny thing. We are the light of the candle as much as we are the wax. So we want to enjoy the body, you know, sleep the body well, feed the body well, exercise the body. That's great. We have a body. That's the wax candle. But we are the light. And imagine if we had a world where our task was just to find other candles lean over and light each of them up. Yes. It takes nothing away from our wick. I nothing love from that. our flame. That's the kind of world I think the wheel of awareness offers us as a step that we can do together. I love that. I think we need we need more of that in this world today. So ultimately how do we cultivate more kind intention and compassion in our lives? Well, I think, you know, when you do a daily practice, the research shows of these inner statements of kind regard, it's amazing, but they actually do have an impact on people's lives. And when you combine that with opening to a sense of our interconnection that you do in the third segment of the rim, uh, I'm sorry, the fourth segment of the rim, and then along with just dropping into the hub itself, uh, this sense of kindness naturally arises from integration of consciousness. And, you know, just doing this practice, I know you're also, you're working with these, these people that you mentioned in the book, but are they, if someone just followed the wheel of awareness practice, would they inherently, you know, work through their traumas or would they need to have kind of a support of a therapist or, I mean, how much can we do on our own with the wheel of awareness? You know, I think people, um, who experience severe attachment trauma uh, can benefit from the wheel. And it's often in conjunction with an excellent therapist who's aware of attachment issues. Um, And I think uh, my colleagues and I would say that, you know, you need a, a healing relationship to work with these inner practices like the wheel. Uh, It's often not a substitute for the kind of healing that happens in a in a really excellent therapy. That being said, you know, people can start out with the wheel, see how it goes. There may be things that may be upsetting, like if, you know, there were parts of your body that were violated, you know, it may be just too upsetting. And then if you find anything on the rim is creating chaos or rigidity and doing the wheel over time doesn't help you get access to that, then ultimately, you know, I think finding a therapist who can help you with those particular issues can be essential. Why, why do you think we're here? Like, what is the purpose of life? 
Well, you know, in the book Mind, I address six interrogative questions, you know. Um, what are we? Where are we? When are we? Uh, how does the mind work? Um, I'm sure there's one I'm missing. Um, there's one I'm missing, but the, but the one I also address is why, why we're here. Mm -hmm. And, um, oh, who, who are we? You know, and in the why question, you know, because all the chapters in that book are questions, these interrogatives. But when I got to the why question, I felt really nervous, really, really nervous. And I said, you know, it's kind of outrageous for anyone to tell anyone else why we're here. Mm -hmm. So whatever I'm going to say about this is really more about questions about it. Mm -hmm. um, so I said, but if you, if you ask the question, given what we've covered so far in the journey of that book, you know, if you say, well, if the mind is this emergent, self-organizing, embodied in a relational process, then, then the why we're here is to create more integration within us and between us. It's to be the light and not just the wax. And creating more light in the world, bringing more love into the world, bringing more integration into the world, I think is why we're here. And that fits with the science of purpose and meaning. It fits with studies that show when people live with purpose and meaning, they actually are healthier and live longer. Um, and it doesn't mean you're going to live forever by any means, but I can tell you my own journey, acknowledging for myself, just for my individual journey of this body, that embracing the why of integration, that is the why we're here, is to create a more integrated world, um, has really grounded this body's experience in deep connections with others that feels incredibly liberating and I hope is of help to to people in the world. And so for me, that's that's how I would I would address the why question of why we're here. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dan. I'm so grateful for the work you do and all of the light that you bring into the world. And um, so grateful for, that you could take the time to chat with me today. I really, really, really enjoyed it so much. And I'd well, love to see you in Santa Monica at some point. Come by and visit, Sarah. It would be great to see you there. And thanks for having me on. It's really been an honor to be here and have this incredible conversation with you. Thank you so much. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. For more information on School Your Soul, visit us at schoolyoursoulpodcast.com and connect with us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at School Your Soul. Also, I love to hear from you guys. So send me an email and say hi. Let me know what you're struggling with or what you'd like to learn more about or even who you'd like me to interview next. My email is schoolyoursoul at gmail.com. And thank you so much for those of you who have reached out and shared your appreciation for the show. It really means a lot. I'm so grateful to every single listener out there. That's all for today. Namaste. Namaste.